and your support, and we're just really, really grateful. Thank you. And thank you, too, for what you do. Um, you know the name Jesus means salvation, right? That's, his name means he, God saves, basically. And we think salvation means going to heaven. Like you have a, I got a devotion from a friend today that said, you know, we, we all know what the end is. We're all going to heaven. That's really not the point of being Christians. That's not the point of Jesus. It's this healing salvation. It's healing us wherever we are, whoever we are. That is what Christianity is about. And so, yep, we um, are talking about something very difficult and very challenging today. But Jesus does that a lot. So I wanted to start... Um, we're way ahead of schedule, so I can preach a lot longer than I expected. We'd like everybody to stay. We have a great potluck um, downstairs, so please just follow the stairs down, and uh, we'll eat right after um, worship. Would you please say a prayer with me? Father God, we do answer Tim and Constance's request to pray for their organizations. We ask that you would cover them with your Holy Spirit and with your power. And then every staff person and community worker and volunteer, and especially every child they work with, has the strength that you give with all the saints to have the faith that Christ is living in them and to know the love of Christ, to be surrounded and to know the length and breadth and height and depth of the love that you have for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'd like to start off with a joke. And there was a... Um, a guy who wanted to remember all of his nieces and nephews, birthdays, anniversaries, and he couldn't keep them all straight. He was always forgetting. So he thought he'd go to the computer store and he asked if there was an app or some program that will, is there some way that you can remind me of all these uh, special occasions? And the salesperson said, well, have you tried getting married? Because, you know, your wife will remind you. So, so the... The title of today's sermon for Orphan Sunday is uh, being tripped up. Um, tripped up means to you know, stumble, like you stub your toe. I don't know. I haven't had cancer treatment, but I have stubbed my toe. And I'm pretty sure they're probably close. Because that, there are small things that happen in our life that can trip us up and cause us to, um, to fall or fail or be hindered. You hear that word in today's scripture that Todd read us, to be hindered. We, we're not to hinder children. We're not to hinder each other. Caring for widows and orphans, which Miss Carol in the office put this beautiful um, scripture verse on the cover. Caring for children and widows in their suffering, Jesus' own brother said, is pure religion. That's the goal. That's what we should focus on, helping each other when we can. And that ministry, unfortunately, like Constance says, starts with the people that we know best. Our love, our ministry starts often at home. It's the, the people... We do know best, but we also know their best and their worst. And they know our best and our worst. And it's really difficult to love those people because of that trouble. It is easily to, easier to be tripped up in a family and to trip up our children, to be tripped up in these bitter and resentful relationships than anything in the public. Because when you go to work, you wear a uniform, right? You have a work face and you, you're polite. You're generally polite. But in family, you don't have to be polite. You know, you're in your stocking feet. You're watching TV. You're vegging out for a couple hours. You're eating too much. You just you say whatever comes to mind. And that can cause trouble. There's a, there's a, parents know this is a fact. There is no greater pain in life than stepping on a Lego. And family members, they can just leave the smallest little Lego around. And you step on it. It's like, oh, that bothered me. There's a, I didn't have this in the notes, but there's a famous story at Thanksgiving since we're coming up. The uh, grown mother goes back to mom's house. The family's gathering. They're in the kitchen cooking. And this mom says what mom says. You know, I can't, something like, you know, are you going to have children yet? Are you still single? You know, it's some comment like that. And the daughter just looks at her and she says, your mom, those buttons you used to push, I've moved them. <laughs> we don't have to let those little Legos bother us so much. Paul said these little things that trip us up. He called it, this is beautiful. It's a beautiful metaphor. He called it a root of bitterness. 
a root of bitterness. If you ever tripped over a tree root, they're supposed to be underground. We're supposed to keep our bitterness underground, but sometimes they just come up a little bit and you stumble over them. Jesus said it this way. He said it's like thorn bushes, and it can be the worries of life or it can be the wealth, the abundance of pleasure and wealth. They can all be distractions that bind us down and entangle us. The Bible says they let's run our race and not be entangled in the sin that can grab a hold of us and hinder us. So what do we do with all this stuff that surrounds us? Peter, Jesus, one of his best friends, the rock, he said it this way. He said, we have to cast all of our cares on Jesus because he cares for us. We have to take all of this potential bitterness and we have to give it to Jesus. Today we saw that Jesus said that marriage is sacred, it's sacramental, it's a mystery. And he's talking about protecting children. He's, remember what he said. Don't cause a little one to stumble because you might as well tie a large stone around your neck and be thrown into the water. Jesus is stepping out and he's saying it is a proactive first thing we're supposed to do is take care of other people and our own children. And then notice that conversation instantly goes to family. He's talking about taking care of children and someone in the crowd pipes up. And you think that we're modern and different, but I don't think this is an accident. The first thing it triggers in somebody's mind in the congregation was, well, what about divorce? We can get divorced, can't we? Knowing full well that that's one of the things that hurts our children the most. Again, 2,000 years later, I don't think we're any modern or they were any less sophisticated. And Jesus says to them, the reason a divorce is allowed is because you have a hard heart. You have that little Lego piece. You have a rock in your soul. And you won't let the word of God go deeply. And so it can grow and flourish. And it sort of dies there on the vine without producing fruit. You're hard. It's an exception. It's not the ideal of life. Because ideally, we were made to love and care for each other. But stuff happens. Divorce happens. Death happens. Abuse happens. That story about peeling the socks off of kids, that just broke my heart. My goodness. Things happen in life. Jesus never pretends they don't. He's always about how do we heal and go forward. And then he moves into this very interesting phase where you can just see people drawing. These kids are coming close to him. They want to be near Jesus. And his disciples says, whoa, whoa, we've got a service here. We have some organization. Wait your turn. We're going to have the most important people, preferably the highest givers. They can come first. There was some system they had in their mind of who deserved to come to Jesus. And it made him furious. Todd did not, Todd's a nice guy. Todd is a little too even keel. When, it, when the Bible says that Jesus was indignant, it doesn't mean he was slightly perturbed. It means, it means he was Dwayne at the basketball court. He was like, what are you doing? This is not right. Let the little children come to me. And the problem with this passage is we often pick and choose little things. And we'll take the man is made for woman and you know that's how it was at creation. And that'll be the marriage sermon. And don't cause a little one to stumble. That'll be a different topic. And let the little children, that's another topic about for rally day in September. Bring all the kids to Sunday school. They need to be in Sunday school. We don't even have a Sunday school. I'm sorry. These are a string of pearls because they're just like you and me. They were listening to Jesus and one thing led them to think another and talk. And they had this conversation. And the end result is you have to care for the people in your families or the people that don't have families. And so what did Jesus do? He took them on his lap. It reminded me of Santa Claus. It said he took them in his arms and he blessed them. And what does it mean to bless a kid if you don't give him the JCPenney catalog and say circle whatever you want? And I had that image of Jesus as Santa Claus right there. And then I thought, he's talking about prayer. I said it's been on my mind a lot. Because we come to Jesus when we're hurting. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you pray to God more when things are going wrong and you need help, right? So they're on Jesus' lap wanting to be blessed, wanting to get what they need. And I wanted to share a few verses from the Bible about how to get your prayers answered. And you might not like this. I didn't like this. 
Peter one time, uh, Jesus one time said, I'm going to tell you the truth. Whatever you ask for, if you believe you will receive it, you'll, it'll be yours. Now that would be great if that was the entire passage. Well, God, I've asked for your stuff all day. Lord, here's what I need. Go ahead and give it. I believe I've received it. I've named it. I've claimed it. You're done. But then he goes on. Jesus always adds these pesky things that he seems to think our heart, the compassion that Tim talked about, is a critical ingredient in everything we do. The heart is the heat of the oven that cooks the cake. The fact that I cook delicious fried chicken and it's downstairs in the refrigerator right now isn't enough. I've got to put it in the microwave and heat it up. And here's the heat. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. So the Father in heaven can forgive you. God doesn't make the rules for our life. It's, I know I'm saying that's controversial. We make the rules. We are judged the way we judge others. We are forgiven the way we forgive others. We are blessed the way we give to and bless and care for and love others. And nothing can hinder our prayers faster than resentment or just general rudeness. If you hold a grudge, if you nurse an ill feeling, if you repeat a bad memory over and over, if you allow that bitter root to grow in our heart like black mold, our prayers will be hindered. I remember when I was going through my divorce, and my wife was very generous in pointing out things that I had done wrong that I needed to reflect on. And I tried my best to think of those. And this verse came to mind where it said, Husbands, be considerate with your wives and treat them with respect so that nothing will hinder your prayers. You're talking about conviction. There at the end of our marriage where we couldn't really get along very well, I was not considerate. I was rude and disrespectful and angry and hurt and hurtful. And I felt my prayer life had shut down when I needed God the most. And God's word was saying, yeah, it is shut down. Because you've shut down your heart to have compassion for someone and love and forgiveness and care for someone that just a few years ago you said you would give your entire life to. So what's the key, the answer to this? In today's scripture, you might have missed it, but Jesus said the key is to be at peace with one another. And you know peace starts in our heart, right? I want you to start dreaming again. I want you to start hoping again. You may not have, we talked about Elaine not feeling well and maybe being home. Your body may not be working right, your finances, your, things may not be going like you want it, but I want you to start believing again. Start hoping and wanting and loving and being open again because it's healthy, it's happier, and it gives you the oxygen that you need. Remember on the airlines, they have that thing where they say if the mask falls down, the moms or dads, put the mask on yourself first, not on the kids. Why? Because you need to feel loved by God. You need that forgiveness and hope and energy and life and courage. Braveheart, I love that courage. How do you know if you have a problem? If you look on the dashboard, I used to, I've had several cars. I like to pay cash for my cars. This one I got a loan on. It's a big step for me used but i like to pay cash when you buy cash your car has a lot of interesting features like one car i bought off the street someone had a for sale sign in front of their yard i bought it i drove it to a parking lot i turned it off i got out and the car was still running i thought that's interesting i got back in i put the key back in i, t I turned it off i was like am i gonna have to unplug the battery every time turned out if you have the headlights on there's no beeping the signal is the car just kept running so it was great but normally there's a dashboard that has lights. Most cars I have have this wonderful engine light that is always on. I think it means the engine's working properly because all of my cars have had it and it worked fine. But there is an engine light in your life to tell whether we have a root of bitterness and it is our mouth. If you have anger and bitterness, if you hear frustration or fear, the number one thing Jesus commanded us not to do, he didn't tell us not to cuss, luckily, he didn't tell us not to drink. The main thing he told us not to do was fear. If you have pain and hurt or jealousy and mistrust coming out of your mouth, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're going to hell. It means your heart is hurting and broken and you need some healing inside where those words are coming from. People, when they tell me they're happy, 
I often wonder, well, did you, have you told your mouth? Have you told your face you're happy? Because you don't sound, you don't look very happy. But when we are at peace with God and others, we can have that healing. And you know, true peace will never occur until we're at peace with God. Because I'll tell you, I'll give you the secret right now. Why we're not at peace, why we struggle, is because we're afraid that we're not going to get what we need. And we're going to fight like hell to get it for ourselves. And I understand that. That's reasonable. But it's not going to work. You can't be your own God. So the first step to being at peace is giving, casting those cares on God and saying, God, I'm going to let you fight this battle. I'm going to let you set that person straight. I'm going to let you provide what I need. I'm going to let you bear my burdens and carry my cares. I'm going to let you be God, and I'm going to start trying. Because when we act like we're God, we're basically acting like we're orphans. And we're separated from the Heavenly Father who loves us more than life itself. The one thing, and I'll close with this, that he wants you and me to have every day, no matter what, is to let that peace that passes understanding rule in our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Would you please rise, like you haven't sat long enough, and join us in singing hymn number 405. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.